Hey, good morning, everybody. Tony Mormino here. And in this live stream, I'm going to talk a little bit about Dar Fortune phase down and transition to low GWP refrigerants. There's a ton of confusion out there about this. I put myself in that category as well until I had a bunch of experts kind of school me as to what's going on. Since we are streaming this live, you're welcome to drop some questions in the chat if I can answer them. I'll be glad to as I go through this. I was going to spend about 20, maybe 20 minutes kind of going through a little information here. I had this presentation up because I'm actually very fortunate I'm getting to speak at the Ash Ray Group in Baltimore, Maryland today. So shout out to you all for, for having me and all the work you do for our industry. Greatly appreciate it. So while I had the presentation pulled up, I thought I would just hit the live button here and go over a few things that, you know, hopefully will help help clear up some of the issues in the industry. And I know, you know, if you Google this transition, there's tons of information out there that, to me anyway, is very confusing unless I have someone explain it to me. So I'll kind of go through and hit the highlights highlights with you. So the first thing to note that it is an R, it is technically not an R4TNA phase down. It is a high, high GWP refrigerant phase down. Okay, so GWP is global warming potential. And what the, what's happening is the EPA through the AIM Act, they have basically, or the Congress through the AIM Act has, has, you know, given EPA the tools to limit refrigerants to a GWP of 700. So that's really what it's all about. It's not specifically targeting Fortinet. It's targeting any refrigerant that's above 700. So it's an R Fortinet phase down. And it's called a phase down because we're not technically getting rid of Fortinet. Eventually, it will go away, but it's a phase down to 15% manufacturing, and then it's a phase out of the equipment. Hey, Courtney, good morning. Courtney says it sounds great. Okay, good. Always good for a sound check when you're live streaming. And if you're watching this and have any questions, please throw them in the chat. Okay, so, you know, when we talk about the transition to low GWP refrigerants, we're going to talk about what those two alternate refrigerants are. And really, this wouldn't be that big of a deal other than the fact that the two alternate refrigerants are... They're classified as A2L refrigerants, which means they're low. They have a low flammability on the ASHRAE 34 chart. That's really the biggest probably distinction here as to what's as to what's happening. So I'll go over that. So you know, one of the things. Why don't we start with the dates? Because there's a little bit of confusion out there. Okay, so give me just a second here. Change my slide over to the. Stuck on the thing here. Okay. So. Basically, the dates are as follows. So equipment manufacturing deadlines. The national transition to GWP is lower than 700 for chillers and air conditioning systems, non-VRF is 1-1-25. So January 1, 2025 is when that's all going down, okay? The national transition for VRF systems is 1-1-26. So VRF gets an extra year. I don't know why. I guess because it's more complex to change the refrigerants in those systems. I'm not really sure, but they get an extra year. So after 1125, you cannot ship a manufactured piece of equipment with a GWP refrigerant over, over 700. Okay. And the same goes for VRF 1126. Now, the caveat to that and the confusion is there are some, some states which implemented their own restrictions on refrigerants. I've heard them called climate alliance states. Maryland's one of them, where I'm going to be speaking this afternoon. They have limited chillers to a 750, have a limit that started actually January 1, 124. Those are the dates that are important. If you want to take a snapshot of that, maybe it's helpful for you. I don't know. But um, okay. So there's the there's two components going on here. There's the actual manufacturing restrictions, and then there's the phase down of the manufacturing of the refrigerant itself, okay? Uh, let's see here, we have a question. 
Yeah, so great question regarding these. So everything I'm going over has to do with the AIM Act in the United States. So all over the world, there's different. I was shown a chart of everything happening in the world. It's different everywhere. So please, everything I'm referring to here is USA based only. So thank you, Philippe, for the comment. So in terms of actually manufacturing the fridge, and here's kind of what's going on. So there was a 10% reduction up into 2024. And the, the baseline, I think, is the year 2020. So the reductions percentages are based on what was manufactured that year. But anyway, we've been in a 10% reduction up to 1124 this year, which now puts us in a 40% reduction. So 40% from the baseline. And then you can see in a few more years, we're going down to 70% reduction. Okay, so you can see, again, this is an HFC high GWP phase down. Okay, it's not specifically targeting Fortin A. Fortin A falls into that category, but this is really a phase down for all refrigerants over a, a, a GWP of 700. Okay, so there's that. So, you know, if you're an equipment manufacturer and you're being told you can't use a refrigerant with the GWP over 700, then you have to start looking at what's available and how that will work with your equipment and what's the best option. So, you know, if you look at this chart here, it kind of gives you an idea of the available options to use if you want to go away from 410A. So, so most machines, package rooftop unit splits are using 410A today. Fortin A has a GWP of 2,088. So you know what those numbers mean. So they're multiples of CO2. So CO2 has a GWP of 1. 2,088 is 2,088 times more global warming potential than, than CO2. Okay, that's kind of how that rolls. R22, you can see, is up there. That's been phased out for a long time. Uh, 407C is up there, too. So when you look at this chart, the two viable alternate refrigerants are R32, and our 454B, and you can see that they're respectively 675 and 466 on the GWP scale. So they fit under the 700. The name, the number 700 probably came because these are the two next best options, practical options for commercial and residential HVAC, okay? So that's kind of how the 700, in my opinion, came about. I don't know. No one's inviting me to the EPA meetings in Congress and asking me, but I think if I had to guess, that's probably what is going on. So, you know, the physical characteristics of these two refrigerants are very similar. Won't go through the whole thing. Uh, 410A is a blend. 454B is a blend. R32 is not a blend. They all have similar pressures. The 454B is similar to other blends in, that we use today, which is it's a non azeotropic blend, which means no matter where it is in the system, it's typically at the same ratio of 69 to 31. That's important because if you're servicing equipment, so it doesn't, if it leaks, it's going to leak typically in the same ratio. So you don't have to take all the refrigerant out of the machine and put a whole new batch in. So that's, that's super important when you're looking at that. Okay. The pressures are pretty similar. You could see, you know, 32 has a little bit higher of a pressure. 454B is a little bit lower, but they're in the big scheme of things, from an equipment standpoint, they're very, very similar. The one thing to note is R32 does have a higher discharge temperature, so be careful. You know, if you've ever reached into a package rooftop unit and hit your forearm on a discharge pipe, it's already pretty hot. So don't do that. Don't do that with any refrigerant, but you definitely don't want to do it with, with R32. So, In terms of efficiency and capacity, they're very similar. I would say that's a negligible. If I was a equipment manufacturer and trying to figure out which one of these to use, I wouldn't even consider this because it's so negligible in my, in my opinion. Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about that. Let's talk about the biggest issue with these refrigerants is the A2L classification. There's tons of confusion out there about this. I think I've got a pretty good handle on it and I'll give you kind of my two cents. So ASHRAE 34 is what we use to classify the refrigerant in terms of flammability and toxicity, okay? So when you look at the X axis there, that is referring to toxicity. 
there's two cl- classifications, lower toxicity and higher toxicity. I don't know exactly how they determine that, but basically the higher toxicity is a little more dangerous if you get around it. Flammability is on the y-axis. It's from low to high flammability. So the way they rate it, in terms of, it's, they call it no flame propagation, lower flammability, flammable, and higher flammability. Those are kind of the terms they use. And really, if if R32 and 454B weren't A2Ls, there probably wouldn't be a lot of discussions out there. You know, there's there's a lot of fear about the flammability and, oh my gosh, these things are going to leak and explode. But I, I can tell you that's not well-founded in any facts of the actual lower flammability rating. And I'll talk to you about that here in a minute. So if you see this test chamber by my head here, this flask, you know, there's a little flame, you know, animation underneath it. But if you look at that flask, you can see what happens is they put the refrigerant in there, they mix it with air, they stir it up and they ignite it. And they measure the flame in terms of the spread, like how much it spreads. And you can see those dotted lines there, which is something like this. So this is an actual photo of a test. And basically at the 90 degrees, if the flame ignites and it doesn't arc past the 90 degrees, then it is classified as no flame propagation. Okay. Which is below A2, below A2L. So what do you think it's going to look like if we put an A2L refrigerant in here? How much is this flame going to spread over those lines? Well, there you go. So that little extra bit of flame propagation is what pushes it, one of the things that pushes it that I'm aware of into the A2L classification, okay? So it's not really flammable. It's not non-flammable. So that A2L is a relatively new, I think it's maybe 10 years old. You know, and by, and by the way, these refrigerants, 32 and 44, they're not new. They've been around a while. They're just newer to our commercial HVAC and residential HVAC. So in comparison of an A2L to an A3, you can see it's an enormous difference. When I think of flammable, I think of what this A3 propane picture is showing, which is not at all what we get with the A2L. So that's a good comparison there. And this chart kind of sums it up for me, you know, when I see this. And you could Google, I'm not going to play any of them right now, but you could Google flame tests on YouTube and you could see actual, it has to do with the flame propagation, how fast it spreads, you know, how much ignition energy is required to ignite the refrigerants, et cetera. So there's a lot of things that are involved in the actual in the actual test, okay? So in terms of manufacturing, this is a meant to represent a typical schedule. This is one of our manufacturers, you know, don't take this as, as gospel for your manufacturers. Please call and recall and continue to call and talk to your, your local reps because it'll be different for every manufacturer. So what you're seeing here is what I think represents a pretty good idea of what's going on. You know, you could select an order R54 B equipment now. And I would say if you're specifying a job that's not going to ship very soon, you probably want to look at specifying it with 32 or 454 B because it is a different machine. It is a totally different requires totally different UL rating. It is a different selection. So I would say you know, change that now, you know, end of August for this particular manufacturer's last date to order for four 10A equipment. Okay. So they can get it out by the end of the year. And the other thing to be careful of is lead time. Some manufacturers have, you know, this is showing 454B time lead times of uh, 21 weeks. You know, some manufacturers may have lead times of 30 weeks, uh, even for four 10A equipment. So keep that in mind. If you're specifying a job today, you know, my, my engineering brain says, wait, let these get out there in the field and test it and stuff. But really, there's no time. There's no, there's no time to do that. So um, I would say switch over now if you can, if it's possible, would be my, my personal advice. Um, okay, so questions about like what's changing. We get this, some of these questions, you know, the safety and personal protective equipment's not changing if you're in the field. 
you know, when you're charging an A2L system, it's the same practical, the gear's different. There's different gear, different refrigerant, but the same practical considerations when you're charging A2L equipment, service vehicles, business as usual, you know, make sure whatever you're doing for your current refrigerant cans, you do that for, for, for an A2L refrigerant. There's nothing really different um, in the vehicle that I'm aware of. You know, please be careful. You know, I've heard the word drop in used a lot over the last couple months. We do a lot of social media stuff and we get that comment is this a drop in? R32 and R454B is not a drop in refrigerant for 410A. Okay. You cannot take a 410A machine, remove the refrigerant, and put one of these in. Physically, you probably can. But you would be putting yourself in extreme liability, fines. You could lose your use your license, and it could be very dangerous. The pressures are different, you know. And I'm not, you know, when I'm talking about the flammability here, I'm not minimizing. There is a potential that these could ignite. It's not like a propane or anything like that. But so there, so there's extreme risks if you take a 410A machine. You ca you cannot take a 410A machine and put one of these refrigerants in it even a little bit. You can't top it off. It's not a drop-in refrigerant for 410A, so please keep that in mind. Think of it as two separate, complete complete systems there. Um, if you're a tech, be aware that some of the gear is changing in terms of vacuum pumps, gauges, things of that nature. A little bit about the refrigerant tanks. So, you know, if you like gray and you're a tech, you're in luck. <laughs> I'll say that. So all the tanks are going to gray from my understanding. I think this has been happening for a while. I was in the warehouse the other day in Charlotte and I was like, why are all these tanks gray? And someone explained it to me. So I thought I would put a slide on it so I could look like I know what I'm talking about. A2L, the, the difference will be if you see a red band, it'll be an A2L refrigerant. Okay. This is what I understand to be the only difference in tanks now. For your knowledge, the tank on the bottom right is a refillable tank. That's why it looks different than the tank on the bottom left. So if you see red, it's an A2L. And I think it's kind of a good idea. It'll prevent a tech from, you know, grabbing the wrong jug, putting four, putting 454B in a 410A machine. Because once you do that, I don't know, you're going to have to take it all out and clean it up. I don't know what you're going to have to do, but it, it would not be pretty. Um, you know, what's coming? The new, you know, there's, all these machines have to be UL rated under the new refrigerant. Okay, so... Some of them will be equipped with leak detection. We're still kind of waiting to hear the final word from the manufacturers. The manufacturers are waiting to hear, I'm sure, from EPA and ASHRAE 15 and looking for guidance there as to what they have to actually do in the equipment. Okay. And we will update as we get information on the codes and standards and those kind of things. We will be glad to update the industry as that comes in. Okay. And that's all I had for this live stream. I hope that you enjoyed it. Please check out our YouTube channel, HVAC TV. If you're listening to this on a podcast in the future, you can find that link in our show notes. There's a QR code there to HVAC TV. And there's also a QR code here for the Engineers HVAC podcast, which where we put most of our live shows. And then InsightUSA.com is our website. You can come check us out, InsightUSA.com. Dot com Hobbs and Associates. You can check, check us out there as well. And great. Well, thank you so much for watching. I'll leave this up here for a minute. And we so appreciate you.